very pleased to have with us tonight um, the winner of the 2017 Pulitzer Prize in Investigative Reporting, Eric Ayer, and he is the State House reporter for uh, the Char Charleston, West Virginia Gazette Mail. He's been the State House reporter for about four years, but he's been there for nearly 20 years, which is a terrific accomplishment at a newspaper and, and of great value um, to the city. Uh, he's won several awards. Um, we're very glad that at the last minute they decided to enter the Pulitzers and this uh, um, story uh, that he wrote was recognized and it's not often that um, a newspaper that size, it's usually the Washington Post, New York Times, or larger news organizations that win the investigative uh, awards. So we're very pleased to have him here. And behind every good reporter is a good lawyer, and he's over here to my right. This is Pat McGinley, and he is um, a professor at West, uh, West Virginia University uh, School of Law. Uh, he teaches law there, but he also, as a uh, public service to the community, does uh, litigation and uh, public interest litigation, and he uh, did pro bono work uh, for the newspaper, both in helping them with their public records request and uh, in court. Um, and uh, he has an interesting history. If you talk to him after, he's done a lot of environmental justice work, and he does seminars um, in uh, access to information at the university, which I think is, is terrific. So I think we'll just start, Eric, with you, and, and you can just summarize for us and tell us about the significance and uh, in, in what was found uh, in your reporting and the significance of the story uh, in, that was published in December about the drug distributors and um, their role in the opioid crisis. Sure. Uh, a couple of things. Um, one of the successes of the story is we had, um, we finally had a number on the total number of uh, hydrocodone and oxycodone that were distributed to the uh, the state statewide, and that number was 780 million doses of hydrocodone and oxycodone, just those two drugs. And the other thing we found is that it seemed like a lot of the uh, southern West Virginia, the coal field regions, were targeted. Um, you had a disproportionate number of pills going into the most poor and the most rural counties in the state. Um, the the other the other thing that came was kind of striking is you had these small towns of 800 uh, people, 400 people, and you had uh, upwards of uh, 10 million pills just to, with these one small towns. Now, it wasn't like these 400 people were just getting um, the pills. They were coming from all over. They were coming from uh, uh, Virginia, from probably even from Tennessee, from Ohio. Um, and they were all kind of converging. We had lines and lines of cars at these places. Um, and then finally, the other finding we had, uh, which was part of the DEA data that we got, was um, that as the years progressed, and this was from 2007 to 2012 was the data, the strength of the actual pills was increasing. So if you had OxyContin, 10 milligram in 2007, then they were selling more of 20 milligram or 30 milligram, 40 milligram um, going on up, uh, particularly actually with the hydrocodone, there was a big increase in the strength of the pills. So um, that was kind of uh, startling. It's sort of, you know, I asked why that was and everybody, the experts that I talked to said it was because, you know, the addict's appetite would increase, they would need stronger pills as time went on. To feed the addiction. Right. And so the, this data had never been published before anywhere in the, in the country, right? Not that we're aware of. Um, what it was, was it was every shipment from every drug distributor to every county and also total number of doses of hydrocodone and oxycodone for every single pharmacy in the state. Right. And in some, in some towns, I mean, the ratios were incredible, the number of people and the number of drugs. Yeah, you had, um, well, everybody's talked about Kermit, but there's also Gilbert. Um, you, you had uh, upwards of nearly 9 million doses of just hydrocodone. That's not even including the oxycodone in two years to the pharmacy in Kermit. You had like 3 million in one year to a pharmacy in a town of 800 in Gilbert. 
Um, so that was just unbelievable and then the numbers of pills that were going to just these small mom and pop pharmacies. Right, so I mean it was, it was really stunning the amount of drugs that were flowing into some of these places from the drug distributors and what, um, um, what was the reaction to the story and what, what did people say about it? Well, the, f the first reaction is actually before I could even get it published, the uh, Board of Pharmacy changed some rules. Um, they weren't tracking what's called suspicious orders, and those are orders of an unusual size and frequency. Um, so they weren't tracking them. They decided that they would track that and report that to, uh, uh, to our Attorney General's office and to the state police. The other thing was there was these, uh, a lot of the small towns and cities uh, decided to sue the drug distributors. Um, that was a that, that's still ongoing, and since then there's been a number of states and uh, Indian reservations, et cetera, that are suing. Um, and then finally, most recently, there's been a big congressional investigation where they're trying to get more updated uh, numbers, updated data, um, and they seem to be pretty serious. They're they're going after the particularly the ones that that seemed to have targeted southern West Virginia. And, and so, um, were the drug distributors aware that so much was going in because there were more than a few drug distributors to each, or did they know, did they alert anyone? They, they, they didn't alert anyone. The, the explanation that I got from them was that they were, they were more concerned about specific smaller orders on a daily basis and that they weren't looking at the like the yearly totals, that kind of the, 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 that we had gotten. They were just more focused on, you know, a shipment on a Wednesday. If somebody ordered a really big shipment on a Wednesday, that that's something they might have taken a look at, but they weren't looking at the big picture at that, at that time. Now, since then, they have new, they say they have new modules in place or different thresholds where they're trying to monitor this. It really revealed sort of what was happening and, and how these drugs were getting out, but the data was not easy to uh, get, and, and the newspaper uh, intervened in the lawsuit, actually, and that's what led to the data being released. And uh, Pat, maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, that, that uh, was something I was involved in. Uh, there was a backstory uh, that we might get into later, but uh, Eric uh, called called me and, and said uh, there was a <clears throat> there's a lawsuit that was filed in West Virginia by the state attorney general in 2012. 12. It was the first lawsuit of its kind. It was against the major uh, drug distributors uh, and seeking monetary damages and alleging that the, basically that they, they were feeding pill mills and the uh, opioid epidemic. And no one had done that before. It was a first off uh, uh, unique lawsuit. The Attorney General, who had served, I think it was four or five terms uh, in West Virginia, was defeated in the 2012 election. And uh, his opponent took office in January of that year. Uh, and uh, he had been uh, a lobbyist for. Uh, drug distributors, and his wife had, had uh, similarly worked for uh, drug uh, distributors. So there was that, that, that background, and uh, uh, the, the case against the drug distributors was taken over by the new Attorney General, Patrick Morrissey. Uh, and uh, there was, it, the litigation went slowly, and Eric uh, found that uh, the state had amended its original complaint, and uh, he had reason to believe that uh, there was uh, important information in the complaint. Well, uh, generally when people file a complaint in the courthouse, that's open to the public, and you know, reporters know this, that if you cover the courthouses, uh, that reporting is done uh, uh, using the, that, those documents. But in this case, the court had sealed the amended complaint. And uh, uh, there had been a, a, a later request uh, by the state's lawyers to unseal the complaint, and the, and the judge had denied that, really uh, had done nothing uh, to, 
make uh, make it uh, public what what the allegations and the complaint were about the the drug uh, distributors, and uh, so uh, the Gazette and Mail and Eric asked if I would uh, intervene in the case and, and make an argument based on the West Virginia Constitution, the First Amendment, uh, and our uh, State Freedom of Information Act law, uh, to, and ask the court to. Uh, unseal the documents, and uh, uh, we did go to court. There were two different ongoing cases, parallel cases against the drug drug distributors, and uh, uh, the companies had a, a whole a battery of uh, of lawyers at the hearings that we went to in Boone County, West Virginia. There were probably at least twenty lawyers on the other side, and. Well, and yeah. a lot behind the scenes too. There yeah, were, and it wasn't when just when we saw the roster of names. Yeah. It wasn't just uh, West Virginia's uh, leading law firms. It was also out-of-state firms uh, uh, who are, have some national re recognition. And uh, and ultimately, the judge agreed uh, to unseal the the uh, the complaint, and uh, that uh, really uh, was the sort of the uh, opening uh, of the door uh, that allowed uh, Eric to see uh, what really was going on. Some of the numbers that he was talking about showed up as an examples in the complaint. And maybe right. Eric, you could, you could explain what, what you learned from, uh, uh, from that new information. Yeah, basically um, what the complaint has was it identified what we call these pill mill pharmacies. They were notorious. A lot of them had been shut down. And they identified the name of the distributor that had been distributing pills to that particular pharmacy. And just to give you kind of paint the picture, um, the, most of these were real independent, small pharmacies. Um, a lot of them were drive through pharmacies. They're literally um, probably no bigger than half of the size of this room. They didn't sell Band-Aids. They didn't sell Q-tips. They didn't sell shampoo. It was just opioids. Um, that was their, their, their business. And so it, it had things in there like um, XYZ distributor um, shipped uh, 15,000 hydrocodone pills to Larry's drive through Pharmacy. That's actually a real name of a company. <laughs> <laughs> Med Express to go. I mean, they have these names like drive through and Express. And then on Tuesday, they had, you know, 40,000 OxyContin. And then on Wednesday, they had 50,000 Hydrocodone again. And just to paint a picture, um, like the average uh, number of hydrocodone shipped to the average pharmacy in West Virginia is like 50,000 oxycontin and like I think 70,000 hydrocodone, something like that. So this is well beyond what the what should have been going there. And then within that complaint, and it kept referring to DEA data says or DEA data, you know, XYZ distributor shipped to. Larry's drive-through, comma, according to DEA data, DEA data shows. So um, I decided at that point to, to try to find what this DEA data was. It is sort of amazing that you have a place that is a drive-through pharmacy and there wasn't any, you know, suspicion or they, they weren't shut down uh, before then. It wasn't easy to, to get those records and you had some... Um, you had some pushback from the drug distributor. Why don't you tell us about that? When you were trying to get the records, actually just the complaint unsealed um, that had these references to the DEA data and a few examples in it, I mean, what were some of the arguments that were used to try to keep what is normally really an open court record um, closed? Yeah, that, I found that uh, to be surprising <laughs> when, I, when I got involved. We filed the motion to intervene. and. It, and got the response. Now, West Virginia has really good law uh, with regard to uh, open records. Uh, West Virginia has a constitutional provision that, that uh, has been interpreted uh, to mean that court records should be open uh, unless there's some compelling reason uh, to, to uh, keep them secret. 
And uh, so we just simply argued we've got the Constitution of West Virginia, we've got the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, West Virginia Freedom of Information Act, uh, all of which uh, favor uh, disclosure of public information. Uh, and there's a presumption of disclosure. And the response from the, the drug companies was, well, no, uh, it's true that courts balance, so they have to balance the interests of uh, private litigants. They characterize this lawsuit, even though it was brought on behalf of the people of West Virginia by the Attorney General, as private litigation. And uh, they, they said, well, you have to balance here the, the, uh, the right of the, the corporate defendants, the drug distributors, uh, to uh, confidential confidentiality with regard to their, their market and making sort of a trade secret uh, argument. And, th and they suggested to the court that the, uh, the interest of keeping this information uh, uh, secret outweighed the public's in uh, right to know. And uh, you know, I, I thought that was an incredible stretch uh, and we certainly, we should prevail, but you never know in these things. The, the, the judge was very open a, a, to the arguments he listened and was very careful in his, uh, in, in his analysis, but ultimately he wrote a very strong uh, opinion and ordered the, this, uh, the complaint to be released. They, they also lambasted us uh, to um, saying that um, the because that male had no right to be in the case and it uh, scolded us for sticking our intrusive journalistic nose intrusive, intrusive journalistic, journalistic nose, nose into, in, this. into their particular thing. They came back and, and they said, well, we, we really want to release this information except for 18 words. And I, it, frankly, I, I... And I didn't know what was going on. I, I, I still don't know. Well, no, I, I it was number. I, it, it, it turned out when it was unsealed, it wasn't words, it was the specific numbers. Oh, one. yeah, well, that's why it was But when unclear. they said words, I was like, what do you mean? What are the, what, how, what, what 18 words are you? And I, I think the, that ju was the judge's hour. response was like ours. What are you talking about? Right. And, well, we had to have an extra conference call. Right. But the judge rejected it yeah. really out of, out of hand. But legal fees for these drug companies had to be extraordinarily high. Mm -hmm. And what was at stake for them was it's no wonder when we finally got the the information, the full information, why they were trying to conceal it. Yeah. So they had argued it would hurt them with their competitors, but they also argued that it could help criminals if the information got out. If I remember from the yeah, story. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, I mean, you can't make this up. There are lots up. of arguments. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Ab absolutely. And and uh, it could uh, hurt patients who wouldn't have access to uh, uh, to pain medication. Uh, none of those made much yeah. sense to right. me, and uh, you know it's one of those situations where where justice did prevail, and, and uh, uh, albeit uh, what we learned was shocking, stunning to me. When I first read Eric's uh, uh, pieces that won the Pulitzer, I wrote to him and I said, "I'm just I'm angry. I'm shocked." Because I, I didn't know all the pieces. Yeah, Eric I hadn't did. shared the numbers, the full numbers from the DEA. Yeah. So, so then once, once you had the, the, uh, the court document, the complaint unsealed, and you had some phrases in there, and you, and you realized that there was DEA data um, that would show uh, how many pills were going specifically where in the state, uh, what did you do next? We filed a FOIA in August 2016, early August. And we were met with a response saying something along the lines of, we'll search for those records and we'll look for them and when, if and when we find them, we'll let you know. And you filed and, the FOIA with? Yeah, with the Attorney General's office. The five-day limit would pass and then... Well, the five-day limit is... Yeah. Uh, the law requires a response from the government agency within five working days. Uh, and yeah, and so then they did that yeah. again. They said, um, we, we're still searching for the records. We'll get back to you on this and such and such a date. Then they did it again. Then Pat came up with the idea, well, FOIA, FOIA for asking them for, shows something that shows they're actually doing a search for this 
DEA data. I wrote that and, down. Yeah. I think that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they had they came back with something, but it was dated after the FOIA saying, and it was something along the lines of, uh, "Joe, can you look for this or something? You know, can it, you respond?" It was just one email. After yeah, it was Joe just one email. Yeah, just uh, one by email. that time, almost two months had passed yeah. since the original FOIA five day. Uh, uh, limit on how long it takes to respond, and they just stonewalled throughout that period. And the backdrop was there was a election going on, and this had become sort of the centerpiece of the election. The, the attorney general was being attacked as being a, uh, a sort of a alleged tool of the uh, of the drug firms, and um, his opponent was attacking him during this period. Right. So this attorney general, and I just want to talk a, a little bit about the attorney general because this was not your first go around with him on this, on this case and trying to get information. Why don't you talk about um, really before you intervened in the lawsuit and, and, and what kind of pushback and obstacles that you faced? Yeah, the first, the first time we found out about, uh, the first time I even learned what a drug distributor was, was in July 2013. And we got a tip that um, a company called Cardinal Health had paid for the inaugural ceremony of the newly elected attorney general. And um, I, I did a little bit of digging and um, talked to sources. Um, and they told me that he was a former um, a lobbyist for the trade association that lobbied for these drug companies. And then that his wife was also like the lead lobbyist for Cardinal Health. So um, we, the first story was kind of a simple story. It just was saying that um, you know, you, you, he inherited this lawsuit, which was filed by his predecessor, and that now that he inherited it, he was being his campaign. And there were numerous donations from these companies, that, from the executives of these companies. Um, and then they also paid for his inaugural. So that was, that was kind of the first story that we had back in 2013. So when that got out, uh, it, uh, did he announce that he was not going to be involved in the case because of this? Well, he claimed he had recused himself from the case and stepped aside at the beginning of the year. And then um, we filed some FOIAs that uh, would ultimately um, show that it contradicted his assertions that he had, had recused himself from the case. Because that mail didn't accuse uh, the Attorney General of acting unethically, they were just inquiring about whether he was continuing to supervise a case brought by his predecessor against the drug distributor company. It's worthy of mention that, that three of them are in the top 15 Fortune 500 companies. And, and probably most of you don't even know the, uh, know the names. On the Fortune 500, Number one's Walmart. Number two, Berkshire Hathaway. Number three, uh, Apple. Number four, Exxon Mobil. And number five is this company called McKesson. And um, if you would have asked me, well, I guess I learned about McKesson in like 2014, but it was like off my radar. I, I would have had no idea that they were so big. And then the other two distributors are in the top 15. All three of the big three are bigger than. Microsoft, they're bigger than IBM, they're bigger than Boeing. Billion dollar corporation. The McKesson CEO, I, I believe, um, there had been stories about him. He was the highest paid CEO in the country. At one point got uh, compensation over 200 million uh, with bonuses and all that stuff. After uh, Eric's initial FOIA request did uncover some information that seemed pretty clear to indicate that the Attorney General, rather than uh, recusing himself from supervising this case uh, because he, he had connections, his wife had connections, uh, before he was elected to, uh, uh, to the defendants in the case, uh, that he continued to supervise it. And that, that's something the public had a right to know. And so uh, the editor of the Gazette, Eric, asked me to, to follow up and see what I could do because I, I've done FOIA litigation. And I, I probably was a little too nice. I, I, I wrote letters and, uh, and contacted the Attorney General's office. The response from the Deputy Attorney General was basically the stonewall. And I, I, I thought it was important to make a paper trail. Uh, and so I had this 
months of correspondence back and forth and phone calls. And they started out by saying, if we had the information you re requested, it would be exempt. And my response to that was, well, no, you have to look for it. And then you have to tell me what the exemption is. And so it was inching along with me reminding the Deputy Attorney General that the cover-up is always worse than the original sin. Uh, and, but this stretched into from September oh, to the next spring. And finally, uh, I think they called you, Eric, and said you could, you could, could come and look, look at, the, at the, the documents. And they said they were, they were exempt under uh, attorney-client privilege, uh, internal agency memoranda, executive privilege, but, uh, but you could come and look, look at them. Look at them, but not copy or take photograph. a photograph. Right. And <laughs> Which was a weird response. And they, <laughs> they, and they, they, they gave Eric But then a time. we found how later, why? We, you know, we come to 110, you know, in the afternoon. Right. To the I attorney. was all geared up to go over there. Yeah, and, and I got this email that said, well, you can't do any of this stuff. And we're doing this as a favor, you know, just to avoid any litigation. And uh, so I wrote an email back uh, immediately, and I said, well, that's, you know, we're not... Well, because they, they said that they were going to black out the entire, mm -hmm. every document was going to be completely blacked out, redacted. There'd be nothing. Even the date, even the... <laughs> the date, the date, the, 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 I, who, yeah. The, whether it was a, you know, a, a letterhead, who, and that was preposterous. And, and so I said, well, that's not acceptable. That, and I, I quoted the case law. This, I got this together really quickly, case law and the statute, and, and said, well, no, that's not acceptable. And, and their response was, well, appointments canceled. Right. We'll get back to you. And they didn't. And ultimately, we filed a FOIA suit against them. And there's a, a, quite a bit of back and forth in the, in the uh, trial court in uh, Kanawha County, West Virginia, in Charleston. And, and uh, ultimately, I thought we had a, an excellent case. Uh, the, but the, the, uh, the judge granted summary judgment against us, uh, which uh, was very dismaying. But it, it, what seemed like a loss, uh, turned out to be a victory. Eric can explain My the follow My son was at home and he calls and said, somebody just dropped off documents in your mailbox at your house and it was a package of documents that contradicted all the Attorney General's assertions and said things like, um, the Attorney General has specific instructions about this lawsuit during the time that he said he was being recused, that he had specific instructions um, we decided we were um, that was you know we were going to run with the story, but we all of a sudden got blowback from his top deputy, who was not. Or sent, you can explain what he said in your letter or phone call to you. Well, the, his, uh, the solicitor general of West Virginia. This is a guy who was a very smart lawyer. He had clerked for Justice Kennedy, I, I think, think so. uh, one of the U.S. Supreme Court justices. And uh, uh, Eric had, had contacted the Attorney General's office for a comment because the documents that we received from the whistleblower were, were documents that fell within the scope of our FOIA request. And they, and, and, uh, at the least stuff one that of was them denied was, wasn't mentioned in a Vaughn index, it wasn't identified. And so he asked for a comment. Instead of getting back to Eric, the, the, uh, the lawyer for the Attorney General called me. And I happened to be in Tennessee, actually. I was in Knoxville. In the, airport parking garage, I get this call and he, and he says, well, you can't, if, you, if the, your client publishes that, uh, that will violate a court order. The, the judge has the information, documents, again, sealed the, uh, that the, the attorney general had given the court. Uh, uh, you will, you and the, and the uh, uh, Gazette will face sanctions. And I said, Knowing this, this, this lawyer who clerked for U.S. Supreme Court Justice would know this. I said, "Have you heard of the Pentagon Papers case? The, this is a classic case of prior restraint." And he said, "Well, you, yeah, I expect you to relay your the, the, this message to your client." And I said, "Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that, but I don't think it'll." Uh, 
have any impact at all. And of course, we did have discussions the, the weekend before the, the story ran on, uh, on Sunday uh, because it was a, a, a threat to the, to the newspaper, uh, and, but ultimately, uh, in, consistent with uh, Charleston Gazette Mail's history, the, uh, the, the courageous reporting and, uh, and uh, <laughs> management of that paper said, go ahead and, and publish that. So you think, okay, that's going to be the last, uh, you know, threat by government or whatever to try to stop the story. But I, I was really surprised to hear about this. This is a yeah. The two the two papers were doing a merger. Um, they they combined the Charleston Gazette and the Charleston Daily Mail into the Gazette Mail, and then lo and behold, um, we find out we have an investigative subpoena seeking personnel records and um, financial records related to the merger. Um, and he files it in a county outside of Charleston, outside of Kanawha County where we are, um, Putnam County, where he had a 50% chance of getting the Republican judge. Um, he got the Democratic judge and he, the, um, his investigation and his efforts to uh, Put a halt to the merger were thrown out by the judge. And yeah, he being the attorney general. <laughs> yeah. And it was an antitrust case and uh, uh, against the newspaper, and it just, uh, as the court found, it it, uh, uh, it had no real basis in law or, or fact. But it required the the uh, paper to defend itself, the cost of litigation, and so forth. I, I'm not an antitrust person. I couldn't do that. But yeah. Uh, you, the, the, the paper had to retain counsel, and uh, uh, especially to, today when when uh, uh, newspapers, uh, print media, are under so much uh, pressure to keep costs down, uh, it naturally is intimidating. But because uh, that mails press forward, so so you really understand when the Pulitzer board talked about being able to prevail in this story. Um, in the face of serious opposition that came from a couple different places, and the attorney general is has sort of has gone on, and he eventually yeah, sort of championed the fight against the opioid crisis, and he's running for office. Yeah, and just today, you guys probably saw Steve Bannon has I don't know if the right word is endorsed, but get through, thrown his support to the attorney general uh, after he was on Breitbart and he's running radio. For He's Senate. running for the U.S. Senate against Senator uh, Joe Manchin. Yeah, in, in he's got West primary Virginia. opposition. So, um, so it's interesting. That, uh, you know, during this whole process, I mean, did you ever just feel completely intimidated? I mean, and, or threatened? Um, I'm, I'm sure there were moments when your paper thought, eh, especially when they had an antitrust investigation launched against them by the AG. But right. Um, I'm interested in... I mean, I just plowed forward. I, I consider it just doing my job and doing the day-to-day -day coverage. I mean, I did have some nights when we um, when we lost the FOIA case. Boy, I was in a bad uh, mood, a depressed mood for a while. I was really surprised. I thought we had a really, really good case. But kind of in hindsight, that kind of set the stage. We think, we're, we're not sure of this, but we think, you know, just that considering you know the DEA, DEA data which he did release under FOIA two weeks before the election started that maybe we just you know had planted a seed that we weren't scared about going to court um, we were serious um, actually we we didn't tell him but Pat had already drafted a complaint before like two weeks before the election that we were going to try to do another FOIA suit if he didn't release the DEA data you know I don't know what was in his mind at the time but it, at least the po he won by 10 points, but the polls at the time were apparently close. So I think it entered his mind if he continued to stonewall us and re not release that data that he would be, you know, tarnished by his Democratic opponent as being beholden to the drug industry. And, and in fact, his, his opponent uh, had a television ads throughout West Virginia accusing the Attorney General. Uh, of uh, being a tool of the uh, uh, drug industry. And uh, so, and his opponent had resources. Uh, it had spent several million dollars on the campaign, which is you know, unheard of in West Virginia, at least previously. Uh, but Attorney General Morrissey got an infusion of cash in the last month from the 
Republican Attorneys General Association. Uh, how much ultimately did uh, he receive? The final number was 6.9 million that he got from the Attorney General, Republican Attorney General Association, which is funded by Big Pharma, Big Tobacco, Koch Brothers, um, all that. So. Um, so he, he won the election, he won the election. And, and now he's a champion of fighting opioid abuse. He's, he's made it his number one priority. So, <laughs> so I know that was a long story, you know, but, but there were so many obstacles faced, and I thought that was interesting. And I, I wanted to ask you, you know, what, what should we learn from this experience as citizens? I mean, the information that came out gave us a window into what had been happening. Pill mills were not new. In 2013, they've been around. Uh, there have been talk about them before, um, but but what should citizens take away from this effort to get this information out and how hard it was and and um, the value of it? Well, from my perspective, and I uh, I've dealt with these kind of issues for a long time. That uh, government is uh, favors secrecy, favors uh, withholding information from the public. It's the, you know, the immediate uh, uh, gut re reaction, we're going to withhold information. Uh, that's common. Uh, and when you have big money interests involved, uh, uh, in this case, you have Fortune 500 companies, the billion dollar companies, uh, that all seeking to keep information that's important from the public. And here, the, the information, the, the the sheer magnitude of the uh, of the distribution of uh, opioid addictive drugs in uh, in West Virginia was stunning. It was shocking. Nobody took action the, at the federal level. The DEA, I mean, no no real action at the at the state level. Uh, and that it was clear if you if you went to Kermit and you saw the the line of cars around the drive, Larry's or whatever it is, drive-through. Uh, this was a, uh, you know, just an amazing situation that cried out for some kind of response. And people were dying uh, by the hundreds. Or uh, uh, last year, how many? Uh, Eight hundred and eighty-six. At last count, yeah, uh, highest overdose death rate in the nation, and yet that information wasn't public, and the and the the lawyers uh, for the drug companies fought to to uh, uh, keep it secret. Uh, the attorney general's office didn't push for the disclosure, and the the bottom line is uh, there's a, a, a saying that I, I don't know who to attribute to: uh, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, and I think. Uh, Citizens have to be cynical. They have to ask questions. Uh, we need real journalism uh, to ferret out uh, the, the information that, that can have such an impact uh, on communities, on uh, the broader, the, the nation. And this is a national uh, issue, the, the opioid epidemic. And it's uh, uh, it, the importance of, uh, of op open records of the ports of courts in, in validating the First Amendment and the, the public's right to know is, is, is really what I take. This is just another example of the importance uh, of law and of uh, the First Amendment and the work that journalists do. Yeah, we were talking earlier, freedom of the press is really, it's, it's in our Constitution, it's in the First Amendment, but it's in a judge's hands, you know, when you're in court trying to get something. So the support for press freedom and the access to courtroom, for example, in this um, was so important, and, and you had a judge that had agreed. Um, I want to open it up for questions. I'm Caroline. I am an undergraduate student here. Um, I'm really interested in the opioid epidemic, and I was I've been doing a lot of reading myself. And what I think is most interesting, at, like of investigative journalism as opposed to say academic literature, is is that um, the the, the nose, the, <laughs> that what you, I don't remember how you phrased it. Intrusive um, journalistic nose. Yes, <laughs> that, the intrusive that. journalistic, journalistic nose. nose. Um, so I was wondering if you did any digging um, at the actual pill mill clinics, the prescribers, um, if you got into any of the roles or if you were just focused more on the larger drug distribution companies. Um, and also I've heard a lot um, about 
particularly in the Rust Belt, this opioid pill economy that sort of surfaced where rather than, um, where the pills themselves became a sort of currency. Um, and if, that's something that you wouldn't really be able to get at if you weren't doing it from a journalistic perspective because it's so narrative and it's so rooted in personal experience. So if you could speak to any of those things, I'd really appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, um, we, I started probably about three years ago doing a lot of stuff about the pill mills because we, they passed a law. There had been about 55 in the state and they made, they, ha they made them have to get licenses. So once they had to get licenses, they got, the state got to do inspections. And you had these like 200 page reports with this just crazy information. Like you had um, locations that had special machines. The doctors weren't even in, in the building and they were churning out prescriptions by the hundreds. And it talked about the cash only system. It talked about, um, you know, armed guards at these places, you know, these, these health inspectors with the state DHHR were going in there and it said, everybody's, you know, got a gun. Um, there was no real, um, according to the inspection reports, there was no real uh, exams or anything like that. They would maybe take your blood pressure if there was uh, if you're lucky or, or your temperature or something like that or your weight. And they had, um, retired, um, because they needed an armed presence there, the retired um, police officers were doing the exams. We had one in Charleston that was the case. And we had a number of um, doctors, um, Joel who's here, read about uh, Dr. Durakashan, your favorite player. Uh, he read a lot of stories about that. I mean, you had these cases. They did start, you know, cracking down on the doctors. Um, pointing to, um, they had a system set up where you could identify um, doctors that, whose prescriptions had led to fatal overdoses. So they, they, they did that. I will say that we did this session earlier today at Middleton Tennessee State University and afterward a student came up and said that they had given him a, a prescription after he had his wisdom teeth out of, and he got like 12 pills and he said, I didn't need them at all. I was, you know, he didn't use them, but someone came up to him at some point and asked him if he would sell them, you know. And so um, there is that, and, you've, and certainly there have been stories about um, even elderly people uh, who have had prescriptions and have uh, sold them who need, you know, need the money. So, And I think that with these drive throughs what you were describing, I mean, clearly not everybody had a prescription and needed it mentioning the pharmacies and physicians and their culpability, and they certainly is, there's plenty of culpability there. But you, when you add the, these Fortune 500 drug distributors, what you have is, is something like a legal cartel. And when we all think about the, the Mexican or the cartel or the Colombian cartel, here you had billions of dollars uh, 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 being paid for drugs through a process that, at least on the surface, was was legal and legitimate. I mean, it's certainly legal to distribute drugs, painkillers, uh, to pharmacies. It's it's legal to write prescriptions, uh, physicians write prescriptions, but it was all a facade. And uh, while Doctors certainly have responsibility in the pharmacies. These drug companies that were making billions of dollars had to know when uh, they were distributing these enormous amounts of these opioid drugs in little towns in southern West Virginia that this, this was part of an illegal drug trade. And you've got the manufacturers too, like uh, Purdue Pharma, who you know, for years insisted that these uh, OxyContin was non-addictive. So it, you've got just so many different levels. And as I've come to know, depending on what the story is, one will, the, one will blame the other. The pharmacists all blame the doctors. The uh, distributors blame the doctors and the pharmacists. And they're just filling orders. And um, they're all valid prescriptions. And, Everybody's just sort of always just pointing the finger at everybody else. And all that was under the radar screen. It didn't, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't disclosed. 
the, a, a huge, you know, billion dollar economy, part of the economy, yeah. and not, uh, no one uh, yeah. disclosed it. And, you know, the distributors also will point their fingers at the DEA, and I would agree the DEA dropped the ball as well. Absolutely. Yeah. What was the reaction from your readership in West Virginia? Uh, was there kind of a, a, a lot of outrage expressed um, at being the victims of this uh, business? Yeah, because um, there have been so many, a lot of great coverage, but nobody, one thing we had that was effective was we really wrote about, we were the first ones to kind of write about the size of these companies and, you know, the, the, the salaries and the, the revenue and, and that kind of thing. I got um, lots of uh, uh, emails from, uh, hundreds of emails from families who lost loved ones. Um, there was also a great deal of uh, reaction from people who had left West Virginia and lived in other states and, you know, they were sorry to, you know, that this was going on, but happy to see, you know, a, a spotlight was being shined on the on the state, so um, it was kind of a mix of that. But um, I mean, I was getting emails from Brazil and Denmark, and the story seemed to really resonate uh, internationally. I'm a um, healthcare provider, and so I wanted, I have one comment and two questions. My first comment is healthcare in this country, it's, it's a billion dollar industry. So if Cardinal Health McKinson, and I read all your articles and they were absolutely amazing. I learned a lot of stuff about the drug industry in this country that I didn't know. And that third company that's a drug distributor, if they stopped prescribing or producing or making narcotic pills, they would still be in Fortune 500 top 10 companies. Yeah, I agree with because that. Did, did anybody hear that question? Oh, sure. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, it's. Mm -hmm. I mean, because they're not just. I, and opioids are what eight or nine percent of their total. Uh, yeah, they, these aren't companies that just distribute opioids. Right. They distribute they, medical equipment, um, IV bags to hospitals, um, and it just shows. I mean, I don't know about you, but does it show the appetite? Or, or the enormous amount of prescription drugs that we consume. It's the enormous amount of yeah. prescription drugs that we consume in this country. As a country, right. And chronic illness in this country is a billion dollar industry. And our country focuses more on tertiary medicine, which is treatment after the illness than preventive medicine. Mm -hmm. And until we change that paradigm, McKissick and Cardinal Health, they, they're gonna continue to make Billions of dollars. Yeah, the uh, the one the Cardinal Health and Ameris Swiss Bergman I saw between 2016 and the latest Forbes 500, they had moved up. <laughs> so they're 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 doing really well. The mom and pop pharmacies were they placing orders based on demand or were they just saying I'm going to order 50,000 oxycodone pills? And how much were that order, if they placed an the order for 50,000 narcotic pills, what was the price of that order? Do you know that? What the price was? Of the order. Of the no, I, order. I don't okay, know so what the price. Know. There was not, no, nothing in the data showed the, okay. the value. Was, yeah, Although, okay. um, I will say one thing that I came upon. Um, there's another company called Miami Lucan that was just targeted by this congressional investigation. And um, I found some bankruptcy records and this pharmacy in a town of 400 people was uh, buying uh, $3 million or more of uh, prescription drugs per year okay. over the course of six years, so $18 million in a town of 400 people. So they could purchase narcotics not based on demand. Right. Okay. And then my third and last question is, since you uncovered all this and all this transparency, has the opioid death rate in West Virginia, has it gone down? No, it's gone way up um, because of the switch to the heroin and the, now the fentanyl. People are already addicted to the, to the prescription opioids, so so many of them where they, they have to go to heroin and fentanyl. I wonder if you have any insight as to 
why the federal and state agencies who are collecting this data were doing nothing with it. <laughs> you, could, you could speak to DEA. I mean, there's, uh, DEA should have been there. I mean, they had the, they had the information. They said it was a lack of manpower. I mean, that was their, when the head of the, the field office that covers our state, when I came and interviewed him, he was just telling me, you know, they only had, like during this period when the pills were the big thing, that there was only like three agents for the entire state and there was a lack of manpower. The Board of Pharmacy, um, they had rules on the books that they were supposed to require companies to um, report what's called suspicious orders, and those are these giant size orders that we were talking about earlier. And I went to the pharmacist, I mean the executive director, and he said, well that was, that just never was on our radar to collect that information. We didn't really require it. Now when that suit got filed in 2012, um, the two of the, just two of the distributors started sending in what's called suspicious order reports. So they were actually following the law, but um, I went over there and said, can I see all the suspicious order reports? And they said, sure, and, and they were in these two bankers boxes, and I said, what do you do with all these reports that you've gotten? And or I said, how many are there? They said, I don't know, so I had to count them up uh, by hand, and there were 4,000 of them. And I said, what did you do with all these reports? And he said, we didn't do any with them. And I said, what do you mean not anything? He said, they've been on the shelf, we haven't looked at them. So. Wow. Now they're looking at him, and the executive director of the pharmacy board is no longer employed there. Wow. You know, I think it's important, though, for example, with the, the DEA, uh, not to let them off the hook because they didn't have resources. They had the information. They could see this enormous volume uh, of opioids going into areas where it was just inconsistent with reality. And they, you know, they could have gone up the chain and uh, certainly members of Congress would have jumped right on that, uh, but uh, it was suppressed. I think there was some... Washington Post has done incredible work on all that, about how they were, uh, they interviewed some former DEA agents who said that basically they were ordered to back off on the drug distributors by the Justice Department. Okay, we'll take just one more question. I kind of had this wild question that came to my mind as I was hearing about this, and that was really to your point. Um, is NORCAN a great tool? Does it set up the stage for the opioid, uh, the opioid world to continue to exist and really thrive from something like this? Does that make sense? Um, or are we truly addressing an issue that um, that we should be able to address. My personal opinion is it's the it's the earlier. I think that Norcan, even though it does help people um, and it has saved lives, um, is implementing those instruments in public arenas in West Virginia, for example. Uh, are we only using that as a way to basically continue this lifestyle in West Virginia and other states? Having that available does not perpetuate opioid abuse. I mean, this, it's a, an opportunity to save somebody's life who, if they, if they die, they don't get a second chance. So maybe they'll continue using, you know, maybe they'll eventually overdose. But if you save one life that way, that, you know, that's worthwhile. And I think the, that, uh, that, that treatment has saved more than, more than one life. So uh, it's a multifaceted approach to dealing with this, and, but I think that's an important one. I'm glad that that option is there. Yeah, I, and I know where you're coming from because I talked to first responders and they're, they're just worn out from having to go to the same house three, four times in the same day. But with all that said, um, you know, I don't know if you've seen the uh, new documentary that's out on Netflix called Heroin with an E at the end. And there's a great scene where the fire chief says almost what Pat just said, you know, if we have to use it 50 times, that's 50 times, you know, give them another, you know, keep giving them another chance. So, um, you know, I, w I would side with, the, with that side. But, I mean, in, you know, a couple of years ago, that was when they first started using Narcan and Naloxone, it was supposed to... End, end all this, all, end all these overdoses. That was, and we had great hope and it just didn't turn out that way. 
Thank you both for thank coming you. and thank you for sharing. Our pleasure.